All right, Frank, this one's from Keep It Moving. I wonder if that scene in Casino was true, where Blue gets shot by the cops because they thought his hero sandwich was a gun. Also, please ask about Marco D'Amico. Yeah, I could, I could answer all that. All right. I could do everything you're saying there. You know, just right. hit me with the question. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Coffee with Kalada start there. Hold on. Decide, are you right. serious? <laughs> this guy's got me punch drunk. Welcome back to Kalada. Having coffee with Kalada. Remember, you don't want them thumbs broke, right? You don't want to hammer thumbs, right? All right. Salute. Now we're going to answer some questions. Colada, colada, grab your favorite brew. Ask a question, he'll answer it for you. The mafia, the mafia, the mafia, the mafia. You better hit prescribe if you know what's good for you. Drinking a cup of coffee with Frank Colada. He'll tell you a lot. He's Frank Colada. Okay, Frank, this is from Gene Bone. He said, Frank, uh, can you... Uh, he said... Can... Come on, Adam, get it together. This one's from Gene Bone. Good one. Uh, can you ask Frank if Willie's illegitimate son, Pete Basil, was a made outfit guy? Rumor has it he was. Willie had a very erratic outfit career, up and down, up and down. He could never seem to consistently put food on the family's table. All right, all right. Answer me that in a minute. I could talk to you about Pete Basil first. As I told you in previous videos, I can't stand a little asshole. Uh, I know when he went to jail, he was locked up with, uh, he was in the same penitentiary with Joey Ayupa. And he was Joey Ayupa's suckle, kiss ass. Joey Ayupa was in a wheelchair. And Pete wheeled him around. What reward did he get when he got on the street? Nothing. Nothing. He wasn't a made man. No way, shape, or form. He probably was looking for that to happen. It didn't happen. All right? Now, as far as Willie Messina. Willie Messina, I liked Willie. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I liked Willie and I could tell you, I believe Willie liked me to the day he died. From what I understand, Willie died with no money and he lived in a studio apartment. This is what I understand. Willie was a loyal, I hate to say it, but it's almost like a servant to Jack Cerrone. And he worked for Joe, uh, Tony Accardo. Remember I told you? He watched his monkey. Because Tony Accardo had a monkey. And it's a funny story, you know. But anyway, Jack Saron used to order Willie around. Willie was a tough little son of a bitch. Two times I got whistled in. Willie had to bring me. Me and Mike Swidek, Bushlet. To get scolded by the outfit, the boss. One of the bosses, Joe Gagliano. Uh... Willie and I were always friends. When Willie came to Stateville Penitentiary, I had freedom to walk around in there. Bushelhead, my partner, was in charge of the clothing room. He didn't like Willie. He thought Willie should have watched his back while he was in prison, me and Mike. I don't want to get into that story because I don't want to throw dirt at Mikey. Mikey's relatives, let's put it like that. And Willie supposedly didn't uh, look out for Mikey, let's put it that way. So when Willie came in on the new, Mikey said, fuck this guy. I'm going to give him clothes because he issued the clothes when you come in on the new. He had to change for prison clothes. So he gave Willie socks with no toes, pants with maybe a pocket missing, I told Mikey, don't do that. You got to get out of this fucking shell sooner or later. You got to treat this guy right. Fuck him. I don't like him. I said, all right, Mikey. So Willie got the clothes, and he tried them on. He says, I stand it. I come in the room. You all right, Willie? He's the guy who gave me fucking pants with no pockets in them. I said, don't worry. Take it. I'll get you new stuff. Now, when Willie was in Stateville, there was five roundhouses. He was in a roundhouse we weren't in. So chances of seeing Willie again, no matter how many years you were in there, were slim and none, unless you got in the same jail 
jailhouse he was in. Remember, we ate at different times, though. I went to the yard at different times. So I may have seen Willie twice within that time. And uh, Willie never forgot that. Willie could, like I said, he was a tough guy. He'd do anything for Jack and Tony Arcaro. Uh, break heads, I don't know. I can't tell you anybody he killed. I know he had, uh, I know he had uh, a son, and I think, or two sons and a daughter, I think. He never introduced anybody to his family. Even after I rolled, he continued going to see my brother, who's still alive and out there. Most guys avoided my brother until later on, maybe five, six years. Then they start seeing him. Willie never stood away from my brother. Always asked my brother, how's your brother, Joey? How's your brother? He was an eye from me. No. Willie was a man. He was a man's man. He got fucked over in the end. When everybody went to jail, died, whatever, the new guys that took over, like Johnny DeFranzo, Joey Andriaki, all these fucking scumbags, you think they looked out for Willie? He was their boss at one time. They did shit for him. That's what I found out. And that makes me mad. I like Willie. Now, Marco. Marco worked for Johnny, for Joey. He didn't work for Willie. Marco's a good guy. A good guy. Seen my brother up until the, a week he died, before he died. Marco was always a good man. He was a bookmaker. He was a successful businessman. And he always asked about me, too. We had the same disease, COPD. That's what he died from. No, I respect him, Marco. I met Marco when I got at a Stateville Penitentiary in 1974. I didn't even know what all he was until I met him. You know, there was a lot of cartridge companies that Adam just mentioned to me that were controlled by legitimate guys. I'm sorry, were owned by legitimate guys. The outfit controlled them. If you owned a cartridge company in Illinois, you guaranteed were going to be muscled by the outfit. So there was three, four of them. Was I involved in it? No. Did I give a fuck? No. Did I pay attention to the names? I could tell you one for sure. Tony Giacomino. He was muscled because he was, I used to hang with the guy. And he was glad to give it to him. He was making plenty of money. And then there were concrete uh, cargo, cargo, cartridge companies. They delivered concrete. Well, mostly, I, I can't think of the name of it. It started with a C, Century. I can't remember the name of it. But they control a lot of cartridge companies. What I'm about to tell you now is about Frankie Bluestein. Frankie Bluestein, uh, his father's name was Steve. He had a brother by the name of Ron. I referred to Frankie as Frankie Blue. The, the brother Ronnie is a legitimate guy. Nicest guy in the world. Never done nothing wrong. Nor did his brother, Frankie Blue. Or I'm going to refer to him as Blue. Father Steve was in charge. He was a, a steward in the culinary union. He had a job, all right? Which made us have connections with the culinary union in Las Vegas. We, Tony and his crew and I, controlled the culinary union. I get a call from Tony one day, like I get him every day anyway. I met him at my place lounge, not my restaurant. He said, listen, Frankie, Steve, and I said, Steve, oh. he says, Steve, the guy in the, the union out there. I said, yeah. He says, his other son, Frankie, you know Frankie, don't you? I said, yeah, isn't that the kid that owns the clothing store in Elmwood Park in Chicago? He said, yeah. He said, well, you know, the family's been out there for a few years. Now the kid decided he wants to move to Vegas. The story I'm telling you, I tell it on my tour. He said, I can't go in these casinos and get him a job. So 
get him a job. Go to the Hacienda. See Bill Loudon. Loudon. He's the casino manager. He'll know who you are. Tell him what you, what you want. He'll hire the kid. I'll tell the father to tell the son to put applications in three different casinos. Make sure. I'll do that. So I went and seen Bill Loudon. I told him what I had. I, Could you put the kid to work in there? It was the Hacienda. We control the Hacienda. That was one of the properties Argent Corporation owned, meaning the Chicago outfit. He said, no problem. I'll put him to work in a supper club. They used to have showrooms then. They showed a show and you could eat dinner shows. So he made him the captain or something in the showroom. Like I didn't give a shit what kind of job he got. As long as I got him a job. So he gets this job. I get the word back to Tony. Tony gets back. Tell Steve. Tell Steve to tell his son what he's got to do. Kid don't know what's going on. He said, put, put applications in. And he named the three hotels. So the kid puts the three applications in. And he tells his son, whatever hotel calls you first, go there. That's the job you'll get. The first hotel calls him the next day. Usually they don't call the next day. It was the Hacienda. So he gets the job in Hacienda. Now, I haven't seen the kid while he's living in town. I probably hadn't seen the kid in five, six years. He's a man. He's in his 40s. I don't hang with him. I like, he's a good guy. He's so close. He owned a clothing store. Legit. The only thing this kid be, could be guilty of is being good looking. He was a handsome guy. Always wore suits. Real nice. Meticulous. One night, after this kid's work, and he's there a month, I believe, Tony and I are sitting in front of my restaurant, the Upper Crud. I had a patio in front. This uh, real flashy car pulls up. It was a Mark, Lincoln Mark. It was dark blue and white. It had Illinois license plates. As a pull-up diagonal parking, I see. I noticed the license plates. Tony's sitting there. I look over at Tony. I say, hey, Tony, see that car I just pulled in? He said, yeah. I says, got Illinois plates. I said, I said, they drove all the way out here from Chicago to buy pizza. <laughs> We're both laughing. We don't know who's in the friggin' car. Who's ever in the car? He says that they, or she says that they. They finally get out of the car. Then I realize why. Tony's eyes open up like golf balls. He starts screaming. And I looked at the guy he's screaming at. Then I realized it was Frankie Bluestein. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. We're being watched 24-7 by the feds and Metro. You're going to lose your freaking job. We hang around with guys like us. He said, Tony, I'm sorry. I come here to buy a pizza and spend a little money. He said, Frankie don't need your fucking money. He says, get your pizza and get out of here. And chances are you'll be being followed. I says, you're driving around, Frankie. You got Illinois license plates on your car. What's the matter with you? Tony gets up. He goes next door to the tavern, my place lounge. The kid goes in. He comes out with a pizza. He stops by me, and he's apologizing for what he done. I says, you should have known better, Frankie. I hope you don't lose your job. When are you going to change the license plates on your car? He says, tomorrow. I says, if you could do it, do it tonight. I know you can't. He said, well, the reason why I'm here is I wanted to buy your pizza, spend a little money, and ask you, because you know all the thieves, and you got a crew. I think somebody's trying to rob me when I'm leaving work. I said, it wouldn't be anybody I know. I doubt it. I think it's your imagination running away with you. He said, well, there's a car following me. And I managed to get away from them. I think they're trying to find out where I live. I said, that's probably Metro. And they're using unmarked cars. That's who it is. He said, well, I've been carrying a gun. And my eyes went back. I said, are you fucking serious? He said, yeah. 
in case they try to rob me. And what are you going to do, shoot them? I said, leave the fucking gunner. Go get the gun out of your car. Bring it in. Bring it in to Russia and give it to my wife or to waitress. I'll give it back to you in a couple of days. He said, I can't do that. Am I going to sit there and argue with this guy? I said, all right, be very careful. How far do you live? About five, six minutes. Drive slow. Don't give anybody a reason to pull you over. Now, this part of the story I found out later from the Metro Cop that did it. They happen to be driving through the parking lot like they do every night. They seen this flashy Lincoln with Illinois license plates pulling out of the parking lot. They said, let's follow that car. That's when the car, the unmarked car followed him. They followed him towards his house. When he got towards his house, or the complex he lived in, it was a gated community. He hit it up with the car. Because in his mind, he still thought that these were crooks following him and were going to rob him. He tried to get into the gates. They tried to curb him, for my understanding was. He put the car in reverse, tried to ram him to get away. He pulled the gun out because he thought he was being robbed. The cop driving the car, the other cop was outside of the car. He yelled, he's got a gun. The cop proceeded to fire, emptied his gun into the quarter panel or door. The driver got out, emptied their gun. They killed the kid on the spot. They didn't do this intentionally. It troubled them. It's a terrible thing that happened that day for everybody involved. Of course, I hated the fucking cops that did it at the thing. When you hear them stories, you know, you feel bad. It's terrible. So I'm sitting in my restaurant. Don't know what just happened. Tony's next door. Telephone rings. My wife picks up the phone. She was a waitress. She says, Frankie, honey, here's the phone. I say, yeah. This is Herbie, Herbie Blitzstein. It's Tony there. I said, I'll get him. I get Tony. Tony gets on the phone. Tony's like, what, what, what? And he comes to me after the phone. I said, what's the matter? He's Frankie was just killed. Frankie just left there. Tony said, I don't know who killed him. And I said, he said, Crooks were going to, trying to rob him. I never said that Frankie had a gun. I kept that quiet. Because I know the more you put into some, it would have got even worse. Then Tony would have said, why didn't you come and tell me this and that? I don't want to go through that, so I said. That's what he told me. He thought somebody was robbing him. And I told him it was the cops. And he said, well, I'm going to go find out. He come back two or three hours later, with Herbie and Frankie's father. The old man's crying. It's a very sad situation. Come, that's when I found out. Two policemen did it. And uh, they took him off duty that night, immediately. Then they said the kid had a gun. And I didn't say nothing. And they said, they planted that gun on him. Now, I knew not to say no, because I knew the direction they were going in. I did come to find out later that he did have a gun. It was a legitimate gun, and the gun was registered to his brother. And the only reason why he had that gun is because he thought it was being robbed, and his brother thought he was doing him a favor. It's just a fucking bad, bad situation. And uh, no winners, no winners. And that's the true story. Yes, that was portrayed in the movie Casino, where they shot the kid in his truck. The cop shot him. He shot Blue because they thought his hero sandwich was a gun. And they said, he had a hero sandwich. He had a pizza. Christ, what gun? He's got a fucking hero sandwich here. What do you want? It's, it's pitch black out pitch here. Black. It's tin foil. It looks like a fucking gun. You fucking moron. I'll be filling out paperwork for the next two months oh because God, you and his gonna piece do? of I'm shit. We got to do all this paperwork. That's all Casino. Bullshit. 
Got it? That's the best I'm going to tell you. Let's wrap it up right now. So, wrapping it up. Back to the old cup. Remember, any saying you want, you go on the back. F you collide. You can pay your taxes, whatever you want. And a lot of other merchandise. Right below the video. You can see the cups. Hit the button. Hit the button with whatever finger you want. Spare your thumb. God bless y'all. All right.